Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Raj Pasord. I'm a consultant doctor and psychiatrist, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Susan uh, Campbell Bartoletti has written a fascinating book, the title of which is Terrible Typhoid Mary, and its the subtitle is A True Story of the Deadliest Cook in America. So Susan Campbell Bartoletti is the author of picture books, novels, and nonfiction for children, including the Newbury Honor book, Hitler Youth, Growing Up in Hitler's Shadow. She's written many uh, non-fiction or factual books, including a famous book um, on the KKK. Um, uh, and um, she used to teach in the brief residency uh, Masters of Fine Arts program at Spalding University, Louisville, Kentucky. And you can visit her website at www.scbartoletti.com. Now, the reason why we're interested in interviewing Susan is the story of Typhoid Mary, which goes back to the turn of the beginning of the 20th century, around 1905, 1907, the events begin to unfold, is a story of a woman, it's a true story, who um, seemed to be spreading typhoid, um, but resisted all the efforts of public health officials to contain her. So there's a sense in which at this present day, when we're in the, the grip of a viral pandemic around the world and governments are trying to stop people behaving in a certain way, that the story is indeed uh, very apposite. So first of all, Susan, I want to ask you, what drew you to this story of Typhoid Mary? How come you got interested in writing a book on this subject? Well, I tend to write about uh, people who have lived through difficult times. And I was reading the newspaper one day and I came across the story of Mary Mallon, who became known as Typhoid Mary. I remember reading the article, turning the page, and then all of a sudden I got that little feeling in my stomach like, huh. Let's go back. And I went back and read the article again, and I found myself cutting it out, and I found myself thinking about Mary Mallon and her story. And um, you also researched the story in great depth. How did you go about researching it? I did. Uh, first, one of the interesting things, usually I take very large subjects and I, and I distill them. Both Mary Mallon, we, I only had a, you know, a six-page letter written by her and then there were several articles written by Dr. George Soper, who was responsible uh, and is credited with discovering Mary Mallon as a healthy carrier of typhoid fever. And it was interesting to me to be working with such a small amount of information and seeing if I could flush it out into um, a a large story about this woman, what she lived through, how she was treated, and the implications that it had for people who um, don't believe in science. And the reason why this story is very opposite today is to basically to, to cut um, to the chase of what happened to Typhoid Mary. She was a cook. Um, she appeared to be what's called a healthy carrier of typhoid fever. She didn't actually have the symptoms or the illness herself, though she probably caught it a long time back in the past, but doesn't remember having had it. And she seemed to be infecting people right, left and center. And um, the New York public health officials um, traced her and cottoned on to the fact she was doing this and appealed to her to stop being a cook. She refused to listen to their appeals. And so she ends up being incarcerated against her will. Legal powers are, are used to incarcerate her against her will. She is actually incarcerated for a very long period of time. Then she gets released. And there's another typhoid outbreak in, in, at a, a hospital called the Sloan Hospital, a famous hospital in, in, in New York. And, they, and she's changed her name and they trace the outbreak to her again. And finally, she's incarcerated again and is incarcerated for the rest of her life. And in this current viral pandemic we find ourselves in, there are a group of people, and typhoid Mary may represent one of them, um, who don't obey the rules and as a result, seemed to be particularly dangerous. You could say she was the very first super spreader, which is a, a term that's <laughs> gaining currency. Again, what's your reaction to, 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 to that? Well, the first thing I want to do is make a distinction between typhoid fever, which is um, caused by bacteria, and what we're experiencing today with the coronavirus, which is caused, you know, by virus, by a virus. Um, you know, she she was what we know uh, um, as a, a healthy carrier. She probably, she may have had, con, she may have contracted the disease as a young child when she was living in Ireland. 
Um, we know that um, she lived through the Great Famine, we, uh, or that she was born right after the Great Famine, so that her parents had survived the, the Great Irish Famine. She may have had the um, fever as a very young child. She may not have even remembered having the fever, or she had a, a very mild case of it. And she was just one of the few people, like 1% of the population, that could carry the bacteria in her system and uh, not exhibit, not display any of the symptoms that we would associate with the disease. Um, you know, she worked as a cook. She was had a very fine reputation as a cook. She worked for some of the wealthiest families in New York. She was eagerly sought after as a cook. Her, the families would take her on vacation with them so that uh, she would cook for them, but she never really stayed in, in one job, one household for an extended period of time. She always, um, you know, after a year or two, she'd just kind of pack up and disappear and, and leave. And, you know, as we find out later, there, there was a reason for that. Um, people in the household were indeed uh, contracting um, typhoid, and either she left because she was fearful, oh my goodness, I might get this disease as well, or, um, you know, she was no longer needed, but for whatever reason, she kept going from house to house. And um, one of the things that made her difficult to trace, and that's one of the reasons why her story was so scary mm -hmm. to, to the public at the time, was because she didn't seem to have a family. She arrived in New York from Ireland, <laughs> and um, she didn't have parents here. She wasn't married. She had no children. So she was a lone individual. I think that, that added to the kind of public fear of her. And also to a psychiatrist makes us wonder. She keeps changing jobs every few years. She doesn't settle down with anyone. Are these little clues that she had some kind of psychiatric disorder? What, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the Mayo Clinic here in the States, you know, does say that untreated typhoid can cause psychiatric problems. You know, it can cause delirium. It can cause hallucinations. It can even cause paranoia. And if we look at her history, um, I think, there, you can see some examples of paranoia, but was it caused by the untreated typhoid or was it caused because of the way she was being treated by society? She was a domestic. In the early 1900s, many middle class families, upper middle class and wealthy families had domestics working for them. Uh, the stigma of being Irish and, and working for um, U.S. families at that time was waning. They were considered to be a wonderful household help but yet they were considered domestic, domestics. And there is somewhat of a xenophobia going on there if we wanna look at it from a class structure where people were assuming that their domestic help might be dirty, might be bringing germs into the household. Uh, so there was this, you know, this class stigma going on with her as well. That could have fed into some of the paranoia. She was also very proud of her abilities. I mean, she was, um, a young teenager, 14 or 15, coming from Ireland, living with um, her aunt and uncle, who soon pass away. Now she's on her own in New York City, a large city. Um, she probably worked her way up the, you know, the domestic household ladder um, by working maybe at doing laundry, by doing other house, household chores, and um, finally then becoming a cook and becoming very well respected and very well paid as a cook. And now you have someone coming along, this George Soper, who tracked her down and her livelihood is threatened. She's in her 40s and how is she going to get another good paying job? How is she going to support herself? What can she possibly do if she doesn't cook? There was no training. Uh, no offer of training. There were no, you know, welfare systems in place, assistance programs. So again, you know, where is this paranoia um, coming from? Fear of losing her job, fear of not being able to support herself. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, you we have the fact that men were treated very differently. At that time, you know, women were supposed to be very pious. They were supposed to be submissive. Um, they were supposed to be dom domestic in the sense that they were to, you know, to either get married or take care of a family, to work at jobs uh, within the, in the family. 
And here you have Mary, who is unmarried, no children, no family. Uh, she does seem to have um, a man um, whom she spends evenings with that raises a lot of suspicion at that time. Why is she spending so much time with this man named August Bryhoff? And so all of these factors, you know, when we look at her paranoia uh, or what seems to be paranoia, we ask ourselves, you know, is it warranted in any way? And the other really interesting thing about this is um, after she's incarcerated the first time, and we'll go back to the beginning of the story in a minute, um, mm -hmm. and the, the important point you make, which is how is she meant to make a living? Because they, they, they set up a job for her to work in a laundry, to be a laundry um, assistant, and, and they expect her to, to, to desist from being a cook. And th those are the conditions under which she's released after her first incarceration, which lasted several years. But of course, it was a very hard job being working in a laundry and it didn't get paid very well. So naturally, she went back to being a cook. And there is a very important echo to today when people are being expected to not turn up for work. And the government today recognizes you've got to compensate people if you want them to, to be obedient to these new public health rules to control a pandemic. But they weren't they were not thinking that that way a hundred years ago when they dealt with Mary Mallon. Again, what are your thoughts about that? Um, that's very true. It, I mean, it's very similar today when, you know, first of all, we have um, here in the States, we've had all these young people going off on spring break, right? Down in Florida. They're, think, they, they, they're, they're thinking, well, this can't happen to me. I'm young. I'm healthy, right? They have no idea what kind of germs they're bringing home to grandma and grandpa who are 60 and older. Uh, secondly, um, you, you know, you, if you're not offering training or you're not offering some kind of assistance and people are worried about their families, that's really, a, a, you know, a big deal. They're going to, they, they are looking for ways they're running to the grocery stores. They're emptying the shelves, you know, of all the paper products, the hand sanitizer, the antibacterial soap, the chicken. Um, and they're, so they're making all of these decisions because they want to protect that protect the family so you know and then mary um she is accepts the job as a laundress very hard work hot water heavy pots as i mentioned she is older um but also there's that idea that she's being accused of being dirty that she isn't hygienic enough and she has first of all no idea that she's carrying the bacteria Working as a cook, your hands are in and out of hot water, soapy water all day long. And here they are telling her that she's, you know, not not taking care of her personal hygiene. So this was very insulting to her. And explained why she may have rejected uh, uh, the, the, the initial uh, message when the public health officials turn up to tell her this and why she reacted so strongly. But her reaction is very strong. I mean, she even writes <laughs> letters threatening violence to the, 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 the health officials who incarcerated her. And again, to a psychiatrist, yeah. her reaction is extremely strong. I mean, there's violence. She threatens the health officials who turn up with a, with a carving fork. <laughs> Um, and then yes, she, she runs did. away and she's she's actually physically violent. So any thoughts about that point? Yeah. Well, you know, when George Soper first approached her, um, I think his language was very patronizing, condescending. He expected her to understand germ theory. And at that time, um, you know, germ theory had been around for uh, um, decades, but not everyone believed science. Not everyone trusted the government. Not everyone um, trusted doctors. I don't know. Does that sound familiar today? Um, so George Soper shows up at her place of employment and he says to her, you know, we need to get some samples from you. We need urine samples. We, um, we need stool samples. And 1907, 1906, 1907, that was pretty personal. And so she, um, grabbed a carving fork that she was preparing to use in the kitchen and, and, and she ran after him with it. And of course he fled. So the second time he tries to, to nab her, he stalks her. He follows her home from her place of employment. He sees where she is visiting her uh, friend, August Bryhoff in the evening. And we think he may have bribed August Bryhoff to like stay away. So George Soper now arrives with um, another man who is his backup, and they try to convince Mary 
um, to, to go with them. And of course, that attempt fails. The third attempt now, they feel that, well, maybe she'll react better if a woman um, asks her. And so they employ uh, Dr. S. Josephine Baker. No one tells her um, that Mary has reacted violently. So she thinks this is going to be a pretty simple trip. And it is not. Of course, um, Mary flees and she um, scales a fence and they end up finding her hidden in an outdoor closet. Um, a little piece of her dress is showing. And what's very interesting to me about that moment is there are um, bins pulled in front of the closet. Now, how did those bins get there? You know, the other household help must have helped hide Mary. And that's sort of this, you know, act of solidarity that's so interesting. And in fact, it was very interesting to Josephine Baker as well. And, you know, she sort of said, hey, that's pretty cool that they did that. And that tells us something about Mary. She must have been well liked, right, in the household or respected in some way for them to try to hide her in, in, in that way. So then they get, um, you know, they it takes four policemen to get her into an ambulance and uh, Dr. Baker has to sit on her and they get her down to the hospital and there begins her quarantine period. So, you know, you're talking about um, paranoia. Um, you know, maybe it's paranoia. Maybe we've got a strong woman here, a woman who who doesn't fit um, the uh, definition of what true womanhood was at, at the time. But um, the fact that she puts up such a big fight when there's several policemen um, uh, <laughs> wrestling her to the ground and, and manhandling her into the ambulance and then the female doctor to sit on her, that's, that smells to a psychiatrist as someone who, I mean, most, most people in the face of overwhelming superior firepower come quietly. The fact she did not come mm -hmm. quietly uh, yeah. And and continue to argue, even when she's incarcerated, argue very aggressively with the officials. Mm -hmm. She never she never is submissive. Um, again, what are what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, she doesn't lie. You know, she um, after her first incarceration period, which is about three years, she's offered the opportunity um, to be released. They said, hey, just. You know, we'll send, just say you're going to Connecticut to visit your sister. And she's indignant. She says, I don't have a sister. I'm not saying that. Now, at this time, you know, we can talk about fear, okay, and the sensationalism and how she um, was really afraid that they were going to use her as some kind of medical experiment. Now, what could this possibly be based in? Well, when she was growing up in Ireland, she certainly would have heard about um, the grave robbers. And she, you know, certainly would have um, heard about two very famous murderers. Their names are escaping me at the moment, who came from County Tyrone, where she was born. Um, the idea of night doctors, people who were kidnapped. Um, those stories are very prevalent in um, African-American narratives where they were um where night doctors would kidnap people and use them for experiments in hospitals here in the States. So were her fears based on fact? Were they based on feeling? Were they based on rumor? Um, whenever there's a lack of information or facts, and it does seem as though um, as much as George Soper and Josephine Baker tried to explain things to her, there was a lack of logic for Mary Mallon. Now, the other point that's very interesting about the fact that when she tries to hide, uh, when the female doctor turns up with the policeman and the ambulance to try mm -hmm. and um, take her, but she manages to escape, at, at least initially successfully, and hides in this in this out um, outhouse. Um, but but the pans are piled up on the outside, suggesting that the staff have helped her out. This really interesting idea of them and us, the underclass right. up against the middle class doctors, the, the, the public health officials. And there's a sense of that developing today with this pandemic of them and us, which is that um, the, the, the socioeconomic classes that aren't professional don't necessarily 
trust what the professionals are saying. And the other really interesting distinction you make a point in the book is um, the, the, the sanitary engineer is not a doctor, he's more a scientist. And there's a vast difference between the public trust of science as opposed to medicine. And in the middle of a pandemic, they, often the people talking on the microphone next to the prime minister or the president are scientists, epidemiologists. And one of the big public relations errors that may be being made is that they don't understand the public are much less liable to believe scientists as opposed to doctors. And you quote some very interesting data on that point. Again, what's your, what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I agree. I mean, I, we can talk about George Soper. He was an engineer. Uh, and yet, as an engineer, okay, so he's more of a scientist. He's using you know, logic here. He was responsible for, for developing the sanitation system in New York City. And, and so, you know, typhoid was being passed through water, is being passed through sewage. And so to get a clean water supply in New York City was, was very important to engineers like George Soper. And so that's one of the reasons why he, you know, this, you know, first the engineer, George Soper, goes to get Mary Mallon. But then they do send a doctor. But neither person is able to convince her. Today, we have the same thing, like you talked about the, un, you know, what we might call underclass. Mary Mallon said that she felt they were protecting the rich. And by quarantining her, she felt that this was this grave injustice um, because she wasn't rich. She didn't have money. And we see that today where... Um, Perhaps we can liken it to what people are doing, as I already mentioned, in grocery stores, you know, how they're just hoarding these products. And if you have um, if you have the money to buy up all of the product, you can, you know, you can clear a shelf. Um, let's, let's go back to the beginning of the story, because it kind of begins in, in Oyster Bay, a, a ritzy part of um, America, where people go, rich people go on, on holiday, and, and they, they hire a holiday home, this wealthy family, and they hire this cook. So take up the story. What happens next? All right. Well, Mrs. Warren's first cook um, had um, been fired. She fired her. So she needed a cook because naturally she couldn't be expected to cook for every member of her family, herself and her domestics and her gardener. And plus she had a lot of parties to take care of. So people of her um, class would hire cooks. So she called up the um, hiring agency, said, please send me a cook. And they said, oh, we've got the perfect one for you. We'll send out this Mary Mallon. And so, you know, at that time, um, you know, basically people like Mrs. Warren, um, you know, she wanted a cook who would know her place. She would want to cook any domestic who would understand that she was a part of, you know, the domestic household help and that she would um, run the kitchen, um, prepare the best meals, be budget conscious. And so Mary Mallon comes into the household and she's um, must have done a very good job because she had been, you know, if she hadn't been doing a good job, Mrs. Warren would have simply fired her. And her specialty was homemade ice cream. And she um, made this ice cream with fresh peach slices. And she served it. And there was so much ice cream that she was able to give it to the household help as well as the gardener and um, let the leftovers. And that became the clue for George Soper when he eventually tracked it down because he realized that, you know, this ice cream um, – and and these they must it must have been contaminated because there was not an epidemic in Oyster Bay. It was this family only. So there wasn't a problem with the house. Other people had rented the house before the Warrens had. And he traced it back to this ice cream. Um, and as we know, bacteria in ice cream, you know, it's frozen. But then when it gets into the digestive tract, it thaws and the bacteria, um, you, you know, becomes enlivened again. Um, and so that's what set this off immediately when um, the daughter, the young daughter, Margaret, got sick. Um, Mary Mallon stayed for a little bit and then all of a sudden she disappeared. 
And that's the clue to George Soper that, okay, let's check out um, this cook. And he needed to track her down. Now, he's contracted, though, because the people who originally own the Holiday House that's rented the wealthy family are troubled because, in fact, the case gets a lot of publicity and they get a bit worried that they won't be able to rent this house out now because the house will have a reputation for causing sickness. Could you say a bit about that? Yes. In fact, it's even a little bit more dangerous than that, because if the house has a reputation for sickness, one of the George Soper had already had at least one house burned down when there were um, victims of typhoid in it. So the worst possible scenario is their house would get burned down. As a, way of dealing, been, um, as, as a way of yes. dealing with the infection. Yeah. Is that, exactly. And so um, they did not want to have this vacation house burned down. And so they're at a party and they hear um, this mention of George Soper and he gets very intrigued and that's where the story picks up, where he decides um, to become his own little detective and, and check out and try to find Mary Mallon and solve the problem. You know, George is such an interesting guy because he's he, first of all, he realizes that he could be on the path to discovering the very first healthy carrier in the United States. If that's the case, it will make him famous and I, you know, I kind of liken him to George Bernard Shaw in a little bit, uh, in a way, because George Bernard Shaw wrote a play called Pygmalion, which later became My Fair Lady. And the story of Pygmalion is this man who, Henry Higgins, who falls in love with, like, he wants the perfect woman. And, okay, so Henry Higgins actually loved, right, Eliza Doolittle, but George Soper just seems to like trying to perfect Mary Mallon. He just can't believe. Now, he doesn't. It's not that he loves her. It's not that he cares about her, but he cares about his reputation. And he keeps thinking he can fix her. After her first arrest, he shows up at the hospital and says, hey, like he offers her a book deal. Let's, you know, we can become famous together. <laughs> and she turns it down. And he just can't understand that. Yes, he tries to reason with her and he tries to wheel out the mm -hmm. germ theory and she's just having none of it because she no. points out she's she's never been ill. So this is another really interesting echo with, with today, which is that this virus is mysterious to, to most people who aren't scientists because you can't see it, you can't touch it. Uh, some people fall ill, other people don't fall ill. Um, it's not clear how you can get it from someone who has no symptoms, etc., etc. So there's a collision between the folk sensibility. And, and Mary demonstrates this because she keeps saying, I've never been ill in my life, so therefore it can't be me passing mm -hmm. it on to all these other people because she just doesn't grasp the germ theory. And the doctors trying to explain it to her don't seem to get the fact that it's not unreasonable that she wouldn't understand the germ theory. Exactly. You know, and the similarities are also because it's, you know, the virus today is also one of hygiene where... You know, I was talking to a virologist, um, Aaron Barossi, uh, Dr. Aaron Barossi from um, the University of Maryland a couple of days ago. And she says, you know, the coronavirus, when you think about it, it's been around a long time. If you've ever gotten a cold, you've gotten some form of it. But right now we just have this new mutation. And the bottom line is we wash our hands. We're careful what we touch. We practice social distancing. We isolate ourselves. And we can take care of this. And as, you know, the, the, the scientists are, are cooking up their, the vaccine, the similarity with Mary Mallon um, was with typhoid um, bacteria. You know, you practice good hygiene. You, you know, um, you wash, you get, have clean water. You have proper sanitation. Um, you accept what science is telling you about, you know, what needs what needs to be done. And so there are some similarities between the two cases. And of course, there are, you know, great differences as well. OK, so um, Sopa as a character is someone who is a bit relentless in tracking her down. There, there, there's a hint in your book that there's, there's a self-interest thing. He thinks he could make his, his fortune, his career <laughs> off the back of Mary Matter. And, and it, clearly he does actually become very famous as a result of the famous case of what becomes known as Typhoid Mary. But 
Um, when she's finally incarcerated in the hospital, the first thing to mention is the power, the legal power of the New York um, um, health authorities. They, they can make yes. up laws, they can execute the laws, and um, it's just amazing uh, the power they had to incarcerate this poor woman uh, without any due process. I mean, it takes several years before she finally gets to appeal their decision in court. She's actually incarcerated for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. Without any due process, something that we would find astonishing today. But we are returning with legal draconian new measures to that era when people will not get due process, maybe. <laughs> Again, what are your thoughts? Um, well, that's true. I mean, back in, in the States here, now I'm not a, necessarily a political um, scientist or political historian, but, you know, our amendments were... Um, weren't really uh, used or exercised in the same way that we um, see them being exercised today. And you mentioned the due process. Um, the, the New York Board of Health had unbelievable power. It was power that was unprecedented for, for, any, for any cities. But they were also trying their best to stop this epidemic in its tracks. And because of this incredible power, they managed to put her away. Uh, for two years before she finally managed to get a lawyer interested in her story. Uh, that's true. And that well, lawyer, they believe, was probably hired by William Randolph Hearst, who was, um, you know, he and Joseph Pulitzer were the, the two big newspapers at the time. And they really were employing this yellow journalism. And so he also was um, a champion of the underdog. And so as much as these newspapers were sort of sensationalizing and dehumanizing Mary Mallon, at the same time, um, they were also making a great deal of money off her story. And then you have William Randolph Hearst, who possibly hired the lawyer who would represent her in court. Um, And at this time, the American people were really sympathizing with her. Many of them were sympathizing with her. Here's this woman. Um, They're name calling her. They're calling her, uh, making her like half human, a a typhoid machine who's half human, half machine. They're using a lot of witch um, uh, names, looking, drawing pictures of her cooking with skulls and You know, I want to pause a moment because what we know in history about women is that there was really no going back. Once you were called a witch, we had the witch hunts in Europe, right? We had the the Salem witch trials here in the States. And for a woman, once you've done this to her name, once you've done this to her reputation, it is very hard Uh, to walk it back for a woman. It's easier for men to walk it back than it is for women. So the public began to sympathize with her. Then there were a couple of very sympathetic uh, portraits drawn of her that were publicized. There were were photographs that were turned into engravings that were put in newspapers that showed poor Mary Mallon. Here she is lying in bed, convalescing on North Brother Island. And she, and so this, this, her whole reputation or I should say the public's view of her, turned to one of sympathy. So then she goes to court. Um, Hearst possibly hires that lawyer. She goes to court. And finally, um, it's two years and four months later after her incarceration where she heads to trial. And the question becomes, how much power should a doctor have over a person Uh, How much power should a laboratory test have? And so this is the the argument that is presented in court. Um, Mary Mallon said, you know, even murderers get um, beyond a reasonable doubt. And she wasn't even given that courtesy or, or any reasonable doubt. So it takes three years and she is freed. And as we discussed earlier, she talks you know, she accepts the, the terms of of her release. She's going she's never going to work with food again. She is going to um, work um, in a, as a laundress. She shows up uh, for each required check in as if, she, you know, she's on parole. And then one day she doesn't show up and nobody notices and she has slipped through the system.
And then the next thing we hear about her is because in a hospital, the Sloan Hospital, there's an outbreak of typhoid. And Soper is called in again. There's some controversy as who identifies her and how she gets identified. But of course, after he grills the hospital administrative staff, it turns out they've hired a cook. And uh, he he sees a letter, I think, written or her handwriting and recognises her handwriting immediately and identifies it. It, as the original typhoid Mary. But there's an yeah. alternative story, which is that it's the female doctor who is the one who discovers her uh, in the hospital. Right. And as I mentioned earlier, Soper has written several different accounts. And each time um, I, I read that one of his accounts, um, there were more facts added, more description was added. And finally, we get this account that is really this moralistic and cautionary tale in which You know, he's taking credit for finding her at this hospital. Now, the Sloan Hospital was a women's hospital. And at this women's hospital, there there was a maternity ward. You know, there was a a maternity ward filled with squalling babies. And whether George Soper found her or whether Josephine Baker, as you said, they both take credit for this. Um, You know, we don't know for sure, but... The public turns against Mary. She is has all their sympathy, and she is, you know, um, released from quarantine. She changes her name. She gets. Um, she's had several jobs. She ends up at this hospital, and now the public is outraged. How dare you um, endanger um, these babies and um, the people in this ho- the women in this hospital? And, you know, as I, when I talk to readers, um, I just love this reaction, how they're with Mary, with Mary, with Mary. And then all of a sudden, oh, you know, they're they're against Mary. They just rise up right against her. And I just love that turn in, in their emotional reaction. But that's because, isn't it? She went undercover. She changed her name. And there's <laughs> yes. a sense that she's trying to hide who she is, but the poor woman had had a dreadful time. She'd already been incarcerated, and she's originally obviously a great cook, and wants to mm-hmm. go back to cooking. Um, and that—that's we have a little bit more understanding right. of that. Okay, but the second well, time she gets incarcerated, um, she gets incarcerated for the rest of her life. So you wanted to say something else before we discuss? The I second did incarceration. because I also, yeah, I also want to mention by the time she gets to Sloan Hospital, she has also loved lost August Breihoff. Um, the man uh, whom she seems to have had a relationship with, you know, obviously, you know, she has, um, she has kept in touch with him. She has continued seeing him. He has a heart attack. He goes to the hospital. She helps him get to the hospital. He dies. So what this tells me about Mary is that, you know, he betrayed her. He set her up uh, for George Soper and uh, George Soper's backup man to find her in the, his apartment. And I ma- can't imagine how hurt she must have felt. Uh, and then after she's released from quarantine, she resumes this relationship. Um, I'm going to backpedal just a little bit here because while she's in quarantine, she her her samples now, her urine and stool samples are being uh, sent to two different laboratories. And the one laboratory, um, Bryhoff comes to North Brother Island and picks up the sample every time he needs to and delivers it himself. So, I mean, there's this really interesting, um, he obviously cares about her and he's doing this for her. She gets out. She must have forgiven him for his initial betrayal. Maybe he proved his worth by, you know, delivering all these stool samples. And uh, and now uh, when she takes the job at Sloan Hospital, she truly is alone because he's dead. He, he died of a heart attack. I want to yeah, pick up this point about the Brehoff element of the story, because it is very interesting. So going back to the beginning, he um, is a bit of a drunkard and um, hangs out <laughs> in a bar. And Soper discovers him and uses him to um, spill the beans about, about Mary. And um, he lets um, Soper into the building. And so there is a betrayal there. Uh, Brehoff right. is the friend of Mary, but, but goes over to Soper's side. Um, now, the, the, this very weird element of the story that when she gets incarcerated the first time around in the hospital, um, Brehoff is the one 
carrying the samples to the laboratory. That's very odd. No way that would be allowed today. And the other three <laughs> thing that's really interesting and mysterious is that the laboratories don't agree as to whether she's got the typhoid or not. I mean, they sometimes right. say she has, sometimes they she hasn't. So there's something very well, odd going on. One wonders the, if Greenhoff was fiddling with the samples in some way. Don't you wonder? Maybe there was some substitution going on there, you know? Hmm. Um, and let's talk about Soper's visit to Breihoff's, um apartment. When he gets there, um, I, he first thing he notices is like, oh, my goodness, this apartment, this flat is filthy. He considers it filthy. And he's very, um, and then he realizes that this August Bryhoff is spending a lot of time belly up in a bar. And he's really upset that Bryhoff has a dog there. And he, he describes the dog as this mangy, this big mangy dog. And I think there's even some evidence that Mary cared for Bryhoff as well as caring for this dog. It just makes her very, um, it humanizes her in a way that, um, when that many of the um, newspaper articles uh, initially do not. <laughs> there is a hint, again, though, of this underclass that are dirty, that Sopa is kind of like taking mm -hmm. a view that these people are dirty, right. and, that, and that's the reason why um, they're, they're causing infection. He, he, Sopa himself seemed to believe that ultimately Mary was dirty and unclean, mm -hmm. and that's why she was spreading the infection. Well, of course, she could have been perfectly clean, but just spreading the infection because she was a carrier. Right. I am. Uh, exactly. Um, you know, we really we don't really have any proof that she was dirty. You know, if you, you I don't know why these houses, these wealthy people would have hired a cook who kept an unclean kitchen or unkempt um, a uniform because they were expected to wear a uniform or who served, um, you know, who didn't have clean dishes. So there's there's really no proof that that Mary was dirty. Okay, so after the Sloan Hospital outbreak, she's incarcerated for a second time in this quarantine hospital that's on this island, um, and she ba basically stays there for the rest of her life. Though she is allowed out on leave from time to time, which again I found amazing, given how <laughs> nervous they were about her. Um, so tell us a bit about that second incarceration, and it ends in her death. Um, right. Well, now I guess she's allowed out allowed out on leave, which is quite amazing. Um, but we have to, I, I want to remind um, the reader that she and the listeners that Mary never lied. Yes, she had some paranoia. Yes, she had some violent tendencies, but she never lied. And so, you know, she was um, she had different jobs on the island and in the hospital, the Riverside Hospital. And she then earned um, she ended up earning a salary, even working in um, in the lab there. And she was given a day off. And on her day off, she'd simply take the ferry and um, do little things out, um, you know, in the city. Uh, she visited a friend. She made friends with some of the people on the island, some very close friends. And she would return. So, I mean, I find um, it's not that she was not trustworthy. And the other thing is, leading up to her death, it, she was in her late 60s. And, you know, she always showed up on time uh, for work. And one day she did not show up and she had a little cottage on the island. And she they said that she always kept the, the, the draperies drawn, the curtains drawn very tightly because um, reporters were always trying to um, take photographs of her. And one day when she didn't show up for work, one of the women in the in, in the lab ended up going to her cottage and they knocked on the door. There was no answer. She knocked on the door. No answer. She goes in and she finds Mary on the floor. Mary um, has taken a stroke. And so she um, she took a stroke. She was bedridden for a couple of months. And before she died, she um, she wrote her will. And as I describe in the book, I think the will tells us an awful lot about Mary. Um, she, you know, she left um, money to her church. Um, so it tells us that she remained a, a woman of faith. Uh, she left uh, money to um, Catholic Social Services, which tells us that she cared about people um, who maybe didn't have as who needed assistance or, or help. She left money to people um, to some friends that she had made. 
and uh, and the most amount of money she had left uh, to to the woman whom she had often visited on on her day off, she had left like over four thousand dollars. And one of the things that Mary wrote about at the end was just about in her will, she wrote about life's uncertainties. And that's one of the lines that really caught me with her story, because I think here Mary was doing everything that was expected of her. She was working, earning a living, paying her own way, um, not getting help from anybody, uh, believing she was doing a good job. She was a woman of great pride um, who and she was proud about the work she did and the families that she worked for. And then all of a sudden, according to Mary, she was this kidnapped victim. She was kidnapped and she was just ripped from this life that she had known. And we talk about like life's uncertainties. I think that has such resonance today with how quickly things can change. So the story begins around the turn of the century, around 1905, 1907, that that the first outbreak occurs and then ends in the 1930s when she dies. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, her her gravestone is available. You went to visit it. Um, Could you tell the reader, listener, a little bit about where they could go and visit Typhoid Mary's gravestone? Her gravestone is um, out in the Bronx. Okay, and so it was very easy to find. Um, I simply, you know, drove across. um, I think it was the Throgs Neck Bridge. Uh, people, interested people can actually uh, Google her gravestone and there are photographs of it online. And, uh, you know, as I, I sat there and as I, you know, looked at this gravestone, you know, I I realized that, you know, there, there there's... There's a danger in, in writing a person's life from the historic from a historical vantage point, because I think from hinds, in hindsight, we can be smug. OK, like, for example, as I was shaping the story and researching these facts about Mary, I, I could see her approaching her fate. You know, I could think to myself, oh, my goodness, if only she'd understand what George Soper and the others were telling her. You know, if only she'd understand the facts of germ theory. If only she trusted science. If only, you know, the health department had offered her retraining or different work. If only she hadn't accepted that job at Sloan Hospital. And I want to correct myself because I was just saying how Mary was honest and she didn't lie. But, of course, we want to remember she did change her name. She did change her name to get that job at Sloan Hospital. And and I also think, you know, if only um, the health department had treated her the same as they had treated other carriers, other carriers who were men, um, who were not quarantined, who were allowed. um, they, They simply had to promise, okay, I won't work with food again. I won't do any more baking. I won't sell ice cream. And some of them did break that promise and some of them did go back to work. And in, at least in one situation, uh, the authorities felt sorry for, you know, the one carrier who had a family to support. And so, you know, I think about Mary, I think how she was so complex. She was complicated. People are complex and complicated, right? You know, she wasn't unthinking. She wasn't unfeeling. She wasn't a half human machine or even a witch. One day, you know, she was hardworking and well-respected, and the next day she was not. And she always believed that she was kidnapped, a kidnapped woman, that she was insulted, and she was robbed of her freedom and her reputation. And, you know, that's what makes me think about her will, where she says, considering the uncertainty of this life. And if there's one thing I've learned about Right from writing this book, I learned something from every book I write. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned from researching and writing this book, is that yes, as a society and as individuals, you know, we have to protect healthy people from disease, but we also have to treat those who are suffering from disease in an intelligent and humane and compassionate way. Um, sometimes it's our own fears. Mary, yes, she was very fearful. She was paranoid. But sometimes we who are healthy are also guilty of being fearful and paranoid. 
And and this uncertainty of life that she writes about in her will is, is, is poignant because it brings us back to today when the virus strikes randomly to, to a large extent yes. and, and people suffer enormous catastrophes, economic and, 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 and medical and health-wise, and it's no fault of their own. It's just a random event. We, we, before this virus came along, the, the American ideal was your destiny was in your hands, you worked hard, and uh, mm-hmm. you, you made something of your life. And now... It's, it's actually the role of a dice, whether you, to some extent, survive this economically or not. There's a sense of the randomness of life. Um, Typhoid Mary's story r- reminds us of that, and we're living through it again now. We are. We are, yes. So, um, uh, Susan um, Campbell Bartoletti, thank you very much indeed for talking to us uh, in, in such great depth about your book. Just to remind the listener um, that the title of the book is Terrible Typhoid Mary, A True Story of the Deadliest Cook in America. The author is Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Uh, Susan, thank you very much indeed for talking to us today. Thank you. It, it's been my pleasure. <laughs>